Today we have on Clayton Freck, the founder and president of Angel City Sports. Clayton jumped from the business realm to the adaptive world, and we get to hear his story. We learn about Angel City Sports, and we hear about the upcoming Angel City games that are occurring this June. So tune in. Through that tragedy, it taught me life is finite. You really have a short window to like take what it is that from life that you want and enjoy it. If you can go back to that day, February 18, 1990, and change what happened, my my honest answer is I, I wouldn't change it. You're just going to have to go through it, and your strength is going to be found in simply going through it and being authentic and real in the process. I was talking with my palliative care doctor today, and she, she turned around to me and she looked at me and she was like, do you think that you'll eventually be beat this? And I was sort of like, yeah, that's probably what I'm trying to do. No, nothing will ever take away the pain of my daughter not being here. My reality. Well, I know what my body's going to do to me. I've got a wheelchair in my future. But you know what I've been looking for? What's that? One with off-road the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Just remembering me as I am, happy and energetic and full of life no matter what. You can expect a life to kick you in the teeth, but you always get back up no matter what, and you just keep going. Living Adaptive with Scott Davidson. Yo, what's up, everyone? We have a really good episode today for the Adaptive Tribe. But before we jump into that, in case you don't know, head over to livingadaptive.com to find previous episodes, show notes, context for guests, and links to social media accounts and a bunch of other good stuff. So go there. All right. So today we are joined by the Clayton Freck. Clayton spent his professional years in many different sectors, but most importantly in the business world. Around 2005, Clayton's life changed along with the lives of his family, and they became part of the Adaptive Tribe. Clayton is really driven and passionate. He decided to leave the corporate world behind and take his aggressive entrepreneurial approach to solving the problems of access to sports, recreation, and an active lifestyle for those in the Adaptive Tribe, and he began Angel City Sports. So let's jump into this. What's up, Clayton Freck? Thanks for being here, man. Let's talk your world. Great to be here. All right, Clayton, I really appreciate you being here because I know you're really busy. You're gearing up in June for the Angel City Games. What is this all about and what dates is this going down? So the Angel City Games presented by the Hartford. We just got a new title sponsor this year, which is great. Nice. Uh, will be hosted June 20th to the 23rd, and it features seven Paralympic sports, both clinics and competitions. So for those that are interesting, interested, that's track and field, swimming, archery, wheelchair tennis, wheelchair basketball, table tennis, and sitting volleyball. Table tennis, sitting volleyball, we just added this year. And uh, the beauty of what we do is we take care of athletes uh, and their families in the evenings. We do special events every night uh, you know, to, to create a sense of community uh, and just provide them with kind of resources to – to take their lives to the next level. And, you know, we really look at it like a, it's almost a celebration of, you know, the adaptive athlete. Uh, we really we really try to honor the adaptive athlete at the games. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an insane, immersive four-day sports festival. Angel City Sports runs Angel City Games, same organization. But to get into this adaptive world, man, there was a path you had to walk first that you were involved in. Can you tell us how you first got involved into the adaptive world? Well, I'll tell you a couple of things. First of all, I never would have imagined I'd be in the world of sports. Mm -hmm. I always loved sports, but just working in sport never even dawned on me. Uh, and never in a million years would I have imagined that I'd be in the world of disability. Yep. Uh, and so those those two things sort of... In, you know, intersected my life at the birth of my eldest son, Ezra, who just turned 14. And, you know, the, the journey with Ez is, you know, my wife had an amazing pregnancy and, you know, just happy, positive, healthy, you know, she like trained in hip, hypno birth, uh, right. To sort of avoid meds and, and, you know, during the delivery process. Mm -hmm. And when he came out, uh, he was different. He was missing, uh, essentially almost his entire left hand. He had one finger on his left hand and then he had a, uh, missing his knee and fibula and his, his, he had a little foot on the left side, but it was 
not in the right place. It was angled, you know, his leg was sort of angled up towards his waist and sure. the, the leg would have never worked. And, um, it was a, you know, kind of a surprising moment for us in the delivery room. And I, I can remember, I can remember really feeling like I was the first person that noticed, you know, right as he came out. Mm -hmm. And I remember basically feeling like I was going to pass out. You know, it was just like, oh my God, what happened? Uh, like at first I thought the hand was just sort of folded in a weird way. And then I just kept looking at it. I'm like, it's not folded. There's just no hand there, you know? Um, and you know, it's funny. I remember, I remember feeling, I remember like kind of getting lightheaded, right. And just going, I kind of hold, hold, grab the side of the bed and just like, oh man, what am I going to do? And this like old kind of battle horse of a nurse, right. was like sitting <laughs> yeah. across from me. And she gave me this look that was so powerful. It was a look of, you know, everything's going to be okay, but get your shit together. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I kind of, you know, her like glare kind of helped me like refocus and that, you know, I, I said something to the doc and we checked it out and then we noticed the leg was different and cleared the delivery room. And, you know, that was sort of started our journey in disability, which, you know, thankfully everything else checked out fine for Ezra, my, my, you know, this little guy and you could tell he was fine. Like he was tracking, you know, if, for anyone that has kids, right. They kind of, if the kids know your voice, they'll follow you around the room and, you know, he was super alert, you know, and he was, and we got, we did every test in the, you know, in the book and he was perfectly healthy. He just had some, some limb differences. And, um, so that was like, you know, the early days of how we, we landed in this, this world. And, uh, and, I'll give you a couple more data points just to sort of complete the journey. So mm -hmm. I spent that summer, I'm a surfer from Santa Barbara and, uh, I spent that summer surfing and I just would paddle out and I just would cry. I just would cry because I didn't understand. I didn't think I could ever do the things that my dad did with me growing up. You know, I hiked, I skied, I sailed, spent every day I could of the summer at the beach you know, and I always wanted to serve with my kids. And that was just the thing that I thought I was losing by having a kid with some limb differences. And, um, you know, no one can tell you're crying when you're surfing, right? Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's a pretty safe place for, uh, <laughs> uh, for someone to cry. And, uh, I didn't catch a lot of waves that summer, but it did motivate me to sort of start Googling and figuring things out. Right. And, uh, found a few organizations and people that were doing adaptive surfing or really just, it was called the amputee surfing back then. Uh, and luckily I stumbled into the challenge athletes foundation who responded to my email and invited me down to their triathlon that October. They were bringing up a, a Brazilian, uh, amputee surfer pirata. And they said, you just got to meet this guy. He'll, he'll, you know, it'll, it'll help you see what's possible. And so that, that's literally what happened. We went down to this, the triathlon with Ezra. This is 2005. Ezra's a five month old baby, right? I didn't know anything. And I met Sarah Reinertsen, Rudy Garcia Tolson, all these amazing, you know, elite athletes. And then, and then I spent the whole weekend with this guy Pirata from Brazil who had the same leg amputation as Ezra above knee, left side. And he surfs pipeline, Bali, you know, the guy surfs all over the world rips and uh you know and it's interesting to think back because there was no adaptive surf movement back then it wasn't nothing right and yeah, he, yeah. It, he was it and um and he changed our lives right he changed my life um you know he's he's amazing and uh that was the beginning of our connectivity to the movement you know that was a super powerful important part of the journey and so we we were very connected with CAF for, for a long time. And we still are personally and with angel city. Um, and, and, but with Ezra's journey, what happened is he, he turns out to be just even from six months old, love sports, right? It's in his DNA. He like any, any sport, any ball, any, any competition he's in. Right. Um, and, and he's a above knee amputee. You know, we removed the lower leg and, mm -hmm. and actually took the big toe off of his, the little foot he had and put it on his hand. So he took his hand from one to two fingers, which creates opposition, the ability to hold things, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, he's got a much better residual limb now for prosthetics. You know, we did all of that when he was two years old. 
So he doesn't have any memory, right, of, of the loss. And uh, but he's just always been an athlete. And uh, and then our beginning, the sort of the birth of Angel City Sports was my thought that, you know, he he had dreams of playing in the NBA, right, and being the only NBA uh, player to ever have, you know, to be an amputee. And I just wanted him to start thinking about some other dreams, right, uh, and realize that that you know there were there were other journeys and other paths he could take. And so I took him to the Endeavor Games, which is a very similar event to the Angel City Games. Uh, in Oklahoma and had the, you know, we had a time of our lives. I mean, he set some national records in track. He tried a bunch of different sports and, uh, it was on the track at Endeavor, like tornado season. You feel like a tornado is just going to come down at any moment right out there. And I just asked the question, like, why do I have to come here right to Oklahoma to do these sports? I think we could do these sports in LA. And, um, that was the birth of angel city sports. It was the birth of, uh, you know, the Angel City Games, which was the first event we did two years later after that moment on the on the track in Oklahoma. And it's just been growing ever since. It's a truly amazing story. I want to rewind just a little bit. What, you know, as a caregiver, as a parent, what is it like to finally know, hey, my son's got to undergo some significant surgeries. We're talking an above the knee amputation and a transplantation, you know, with these limb differences. Yeah. How did you go through that process, man? So it's a really good question. I don't usually, I don't often talk about the sort of the, the nitty gritty on the medical side, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, the blessing here was right in, in the hospital, we ran in, you know, one of the, <clears throat> the top orthopedic surgeons at our hospital spent a lot of time with us and he basically mapped out our medical strategy for Ezra and he was like a day old. Like it was amazing, right? He told us where to get prosthetics. You know, he said, go to Shriners because you'll, you'll meet a bunch of other families and that'll be good for you. Yeah. Right? yeah Insane. Yeah. Didn't know anything about adaptive sports, right? And he, there wasn't a lot back then anyways, but um, he didn't say anything about adaptive sports, but he said, you know, you, you get him up on his leg, you'll be chasing him around, the, you know, the shopping mall, just like any other kid. About two, you want to remove that lower leg and take a, at least one toe off that foot and put it on his hand. Like he literally told us exactly what to do. That's cool. Which is such a blessing, right? Because most people don't get that kind of roadmap. And, um, you know, so we, we knew what we needed to do. So then it was more about, you know, finding the right doctor, right, who had the right vision and someone we felt we could trust. And so we, we did a lot of work on that. You know, we literally went to work immediately. We, like we, he was admitted to Shriners. He was like a week old. Uh, we started interviewing amputees that were young adults. How, how did they, you know, grow up? What was, what worked, what didn't work. And we started interviewing doctors like right away. So it was like a two year process, uh, interviewing doctors from essentially all over the world uh, you know, on, on what they would do, how they would handle his, his case. We had very, very aggressive, you know, ideas from some docs. Others didn't have a good, clear vision. And, and uh, I'll tell you this, we did have a surgery booked and we canceled the night before because the doc had a, a really risky strategy that we were unable to understand until the very, very end. And so like, I couldn't, I'm just remembering that right now. I, I like literally couldn't do any work for like the two weeks leading up to that surgery before we canceled it because we were about to make a permanent physical change, right, to our son's body. And we were, it was our only chance, right? Because I had this foot. And once you remove the foot, it, it dies, it just goes away, right? Um, mm -hmm. It literally had one chance, right, to improve his functionality of his hand and his leg in one, you know, one fell swoop. And so we were just, we were sick to ourselves. And, and then we finally canceled that one and regrouped and kind of went back to our, our list and found, you know, found the right doc, uh, who was in Boston at Boston children's. So, uh, so yeah, not, not easy, right? Uh, no, no, nothing no. you will do is more than putting your child under the knife. There's nothing. It's, it's, 
it's really brutal. I don't think people can appreciate that from a caregiver's perspective as often, because we often interview people that were congenital, but didn't have to necessarily go under the knife to the extent of this, or they had something happen in adulthood and they made the decision. As a parent, that's so stressful, I imagine. It's got to be uh, a pretty wild situation, but you made so much from this. He, Ezra, he's thriving. He's kicking ass out there, you know? <laughs> And, and, but you, you went from, Hey, we're in Oklahoma. I'm going to build this at home. Were you always this driven to just kick ass like this? That's such a funny question. So here's the thing. And I think a lot of people have had these moments in life, but it was like a lightning bolt hit me. It was, it was Mm -hmm. so clear to me. It was, it was like this door opening up and it was like, this is what you're meant to do. Right. And everything I've done in my life and my career leading up to that moment is, is right. It is a part of that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, literally every little thing has been, is like led me to be the guy that could do this. Um, you know, like, I don't know, I've done a lot of work with volunteers, right. I've done a ton of charitable work. I've worked in government. I worked in business. I hadn't worked in nonprofit, but I kind of had a lot of perspectives to bring. I, have a pretty good network here, right? And even around the country to some extent. Um, you know, I know the events business really well. I, I, I helped run a party rental business, a national party rental business. And we did Grammy, Super Bowl, you know, PGA events, like huge events. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, like there just was, it just was like, oh my gosh, I am like the, I don't know that I'm the perfect guy, but like I was meant to do this. And I couldn't, it was so funny. I couldn't sleep for a long time after that. It's never happened to me before where I really understood my life's purpose and I was shown the door, right? It was like, this is the way. Uh, and so I remember telling, it's funny, I remember telling my friend uh, who I worked with and I just said, I mean, I, I think I have to leave. Like, I think I have to go do this, you know? <laughs> like, it's like, a big jump, right? It was, yeah, because I, right before the game, first games, I left my job, uh, ran, I was a regional vice president for Safe Light Autoglass. And so I had a $100 million region with 700 employees and, you know, 35 facilities around the state and, you know, loved what I did. Like, it was a great job, but it wasn't this. <laughs> I wasn't, uh, I wasn't creating anything. I wasn't transforming lives you know, through sport, like it just was, you know what I mean? Like it just wasn't fulfilling my soul. And, uh, and this does, this is, this is the most amazing thing I've ever done in my life other than have kids. Did you have any doubt when you jumped in that this was going to be a success? It is a success. It's a huge success. Did you have any doubt though? (sighs) Yeah, it's interesting. It's a good question. So, so I think that at the beginning stages I had, I had, I had confidence, but I, I had naivete Mm -hmm. because I hadn't, I hadn't started a nonprofit. I had done a lot of fundraising. I'd raised a lot of money for challenge athletes foundation, which, you know, is, is amazing what they do. Uh, but I, I don't think I had a realistic perspective of how hard it was to start a nonprofit. And I don't think I really appreciated how underdeveloped the adaptive sports world is and how strong the headwinds would be because I don't get to tell people I'm feeding homeless. I need your money, right? There's lots of homeless people and they know they can eat the food, right? Uh, And you've heard about homeless people and you've seen them and it's just something, you know, in my case, like none of that's the, none of that's true. Nobody knows what it is. They don't understand disability. It's an awkward thing to talk about for a lot of people. So they don't even really want to deal with it. And then those that think they kind of know a little bit, just will tell you that, well, Special Olympics is right. Got it covered. Yeah. Which is not our community, but people could get that confused. So like, always, the, the, I like to say I'm the, I'm the, I'm a, the son of an economist. And, uh, I, I say we have to create supply and demand at the same time for feeding the homeless. The demand is there. The homeless are there and they know they need to eat, right? In our case, no one knows this even exists. 
There's no demand because they don't even understand, our athletes don't even understand they could do these sports, right? Like there's just, there's no demand. Now we're fixing it, right? But it's a really different story to tell, right? And then the same problem with, you know, foundations and donors, which is they've never heard of this. They don't, they don't understand that it's even a need, right? They don't even, so you're, you're starting at such a, such a place of, such a challenged place, right? When you start that conversation. Um, and so I have such a respect for anybody that started a nonprofit, especially anybody that started anything in the adaptive sports world. It's brutal out there. It's going to get easier over time, but it's, it's the challenge of a lifetime. I've never seen a super thriving nonprofit in the adaptive world that didn't have full-time, at least one full-time staff member grinding it out constantly. It seems like that's that's one piece that is required right now because it is there's a lot of headwind like you said yeah and there's only so much you can do with volunteers right and we mm-hmm. we uh you know we got to where we are because of volunteers you know they, they are the lifeblood right of our organization and probably most but you know they go in and out they get dark they i, I call it they go dark right they they life gets busy and they just can't keep up so um, so I think you're absolutely right. The challenge that I see is getting, getting muscling through it with the volunteer staff or the whatever pro bono staff you have to, to raise the funds to then hire, start hiring. Clayton, it is so hard to encompass everything that Angel City Sports does from the games to, to your traditional activities each, each day, the grind, what you're going to do at the games. I'm going to try to do this as you know, as best we can in this interview, try to get a piece of it, at least a high level piece of what you're doing. These Angel City sports games, these Angel City games that are coming up aren't just sports, which we talked about a little bit, but you also have a mentorship program, an ambassador training program, which is really cool. And athletes that come to your program can actually be part of this. They can apply and be part of this. What is this all about? One thing about uh, Angel City sports is we're always pushing the envelope. We're always trying to figure out what's the, what are the new things we can add, mm-hmm. right. To disrupt and to grow and to add more value to those that come. And this year we, we added a few elements that, uh, so far are working, you know, the proof will be in the games and how the final numbers shake out. Mm-hmm. But we added this, we had, first we added a travel grant. So we raised a hundred thousand dollars last year, uh, to support, getting athletes to the games. And so this was really powerful. So we're supporting it's tremendous amount. We're supporting about 80 athletes with hotel accommodation. So I, I, we didn't do travel just cause it would be, you know, air travel. And so we just would, we would run out of money so fast, but if you can get to LA, we got you right. If you have an economic need. So that's really powerful. So I hope we can grow that over time. Uh, you know, housing in LA is hard. Right. So if we can solve that and aggregate and make it efficient and simple for people, we can take some of the headaches out of traveling for adaptive sports, which is sort of one of the reasons why we started, which is you shouldn't have to travel for sport. <laughs> it should be in your backyard. Yeah. But if you want to, but you can't afford it, you should also be able to come and have, you know, an amazing time at, at the Angel City Games. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the starting point, right, which for us would just just get people here. Uh, we did, st- we started, we started a mentoring program. This is our first year and I'll give you a data point. That's really interesting, Scott. So we, we, uh, I checked the data. It was last week and we had, uh, we're pushing 300 athletes register right now. We had 240 at the time, 120 of those had asked for a mentor. So that's a half of the, the folks that had signed up had asked wow. for a mentor. I don't know exactly what this means. We'll learn more as it goes on. I think it partly is that we attract a lot of new athletes, right? That are going to just look for that. I also think there's just an, that it's got to be bigger than that. I think there's just a need, right? That people mm-hmm. want that human connection. They want to mm-hmm. feel like they've got somebody to kind of look to when they arrive. It's a big event. It can be a little bit intimidating if you're new. And so this was our effort to sort of solve some of that. And I will tell you, I'm going to tell you a little story about an amazing kid named Alpha that came last year who uh, was crossing a four-way stop with his brother. He was on his bike, and his brother was walking behind him, and he passed through two in front of two stopped cars, and when it passed into the third lane, an SUV didn't stop and ran him over. Dang. And this kid, you know, total angel, lucky to be alive, right? He's got a 
purpose, right? Because it's it was a pretty horrific accident. And I got connected to Alpha through a mutual friend just like a couple months after his accident. He just had barely come home. And I talked to dad. I said, "Can you know, I'll help you. This was last year. I didn't have a lot of money for travel, but I had a little bit. And I said, just come down. I'll, I'll take care of a hotel. Just come down, meet everybody, see what's going on. You know, decide if you want to do some sports or not. Just come and see it. And Alpha arrives on on Friday of the game. So he arrives during opening ceremonies, which is big, like lots of people, right? Stage and music and Olympians and politicians and a lot of Paralympians, more Paralympians than Olympians. And, uh, and you know, and he's not looking at me in the eye. He's one word answers. He's, he's pissed. He doesn't want to be there. Right. And, um, and I thought, Oh, I made a mistake. Right. I was freaking out that yeah. it's too early. Right. That kept, it, I kept saying that over and over again. I screwed this up. I'm messing with people's lives now. I don't know what I'm doing, right? Like I really self, the self doubt just it's pretty like, catastrophic oh, thoughts right there, right? Like what did I just do, right? Mm-hmm. And so what I did from there was I just started tapping people. I tapped Candace Cable, I tapped Mallory Wegeman, I tapped my wife, another um, super mom who's now part of our team, um, and I just said, "This is what happened. Stay close to them. Don't leave this family, right? Just stay with them." Right. And I just, and I just surrounded them with love. And that day he gets in a racing chair in the track clinic and he races or learns how to race. The next day he competes in the race wheelchair racing, which I didn't even know his dad signed him up for. Um, he lost the race and he, he cried afterwards and the mom was so happy. And when do you see a mom happy? Cause your kid's crying. Well, it was the first time his kids cried right since his injury powerful and needed. Um, he got in the pool with Mallory, uh, you know, gold medalist from Rio, and she gets him swimming, right? Like, and it was a cold pool, so he had to get out yeah, after a little bit, but she's like, he's basically swimming now. Like, like he's got it. Um, you know, by the Sunday, we, they, his parents could not drag him out of UCLA. Yeah, could yeah, yeah. Not drag this kid. He was smiling, racing around with other wheelchair buddies, right? Um, you know, having the time of his life and he comes to as much as he can. He sees up in the, in the central coast Salinas, but, um, but you know, just, so I learned from this experience, right? Okay. We can do this. It's never too early, right? If there's the right support around you. And so that's the birth of this mentoring program. And we're, we're going to lean heavy on the Paralympians that come right? Because I trust them. Mm-hmm. They know the journey. They know sports. A lot of them coach in, right? Are coaching at the games. And so to like be mentored by your coach who then is going to compete, right? Super cool kind of. So we're going to lean on the Paralympians to, to handle most of the mentoring relationships. But someone like my son, who's 14, he could take on a few of the little guys, right? Like he could totally handle a couple, a few of the little ones. You know, we're going to learn a lot from this year. Um, we, we have a special event, you know, in the evening, every night of the game. So we'll be able to connect people with those special events uh, if we can't get them connected throughout the day and and we'll build and i hope that it becomes like you know year-round right mentorship and friendships that develop and um we can really create some special connections there is a thirst for um community and that community is somebody to rely on or somebody to talk to or just somebody to be a mentor to, you know, whatever it may be in that relationship, that dynamic. And we see that a lot. We see a lot of groups thriving now in social media and other realms. And, but to have the chance to like sit there and talk or hang out with or play a sport with a real athlete, you know, like when I say Rio, I mean like the actual Paralympic Games or, um, some other athlete, maybe a national adaptive surfer, that's got to be pretty amazing for them to go from I'm in Iowa or I'm in central coast. I have no opportunities to go hang out and meet these people to I'm sitting here. I'm actually swimming in a pool with a medalist from the games. That's a pretty rad experience. That's awesome that you set this up. And, and, and it's interesting. So we, we started with just a, like a couple Paralympians came the first year, Rudy mm-hmm. Tolson and, and scout was there the first year, scout Bassett. And, uh, Katie Sullivan, who's been out, left LA uh, a while ago for acting gigs, but uh, we had a few that first year, but we had over 30 last year. And what we realized is, you know, we do clinics, but I almost would rather Paralympians coach the clinics, right. Than than kind of your traditional Paralympic coaches. Mm-hmm. 
because the Paralympians, they, they, they do the mentoring thing naturally, right? And they look for the kids or even adults that just are not engaged. Right. And that's the right. That's the power of what we're doing, which is we're all looking out for each other. And if anybody doesn't feel like they fit in, we go we go bring them. Right. We go get them and we kind of we bring them into the circle so they feel like they fit in. And the Paralympians do that in like organically. You don't have to tell them to do that. Um, and so like we, I feel really grateful for these the Paralympians that volunteer and donate their time right to come. And um, they just they just create this incredible vibe, right? And, 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 and environment for everyone to feel safe and supported and loved in, in their journey. You're one of the rare unicorns, as my kids would say, like a unicorn, a rare thing, you know, it just doesn't exist that uh, on the level that you're producing right now around the world, not just in the States. We do see calf challenge athletes, foundation, nub ability and other organizations doing it, but you're crushing it on the summer game side of things. And you're building something that's going to have as many athletes as who knows. What's the goal, man? What's the, what's the end game here? The end game for, I'm just going to talk about the angel city games. Mm-hmm. Me too. The, the, the end game for the, for the games is to, have all summer Paralympic sports. Hopefully we can do that by 2028, which is such an amazing kind of build up, right? As we add sports and if we can get there by that summer of 2028, you know, we would be mid, mid June, you know, the games will be 2028 Paralympic games here in LA will be, I think they're late August. I can't remember exact schedule. Um, you know, two months later, the elites will descend on LA, but we host our own Paralympic games, all sports contested, but we don't care if you're elite, right? I'm taking all ages, all abilities, all disabilities. If you don't fit into a disability class for a particular sport, you can still do it and just compete as open, right? Like we're super inclusive, right? Mm -hmm. And my goal is to be bigger than the Paralympic games themselves. So they attract Paralympics have 4,000 athletes from, you know, whatever, 150 countries. We want to be bigger than the Paralympic Games themselves. I think we could be the largest sporting event in the world. It's possible because the demographics in your area, you have a, a big population of adaptive athletes, probably the biggest in the nation, if not world, a concentration. Yeah. yeah. I mean, think about it. Within a two hour drive of me, I've got 20 million people. Yeah, that's quite a few. And I don't care if you're elite. I don't care if you've ever participated in sports. I don't care. This is the place for you. So why can't we be enormous? Is it fair to say you guys are very much about empowerment? Not kind of like, it's not necessarily about bringing home a gold, which is freaking rad. You know, it's like amazing. I'm going to bring home a gold from the Paralympic Games, but it's also like, you can do this too. And you can do this on your own and you can be part of this. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. I, I have a lot of conversation with my board about what really is the, what really is the vision, right? Mm -hmm. For angels sports. And I think you're right. It lives at a much higher place than sports. It lives, you know, for me and what our board has settled on, it's really kind of two things, but it's creating, you know, working to create a more inclusive society, right? Which is very, very, very broad, but really then the next level is that, you know, empowers and supports people with physical, physical disabilities to live optimized lives, right. To get the most out of life, you know? And so that's on the field and off the field, right. That's kind of, it's everything. You once used the words in a personal conversation with you is that, um, we're here to say that the challenges can be capitalized upon. That's not your exact words, but that's the idea is that, Hey, you went through a lot of shit, man, but like you can do something with that. You can capitalize it. You can use it as a method to propel yourself to the next level of where you want to yep. go. Right. You said it better than I said it though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, so the way, the way I say it is, you know, I want, you know, listen, this is from just learning and observing, right? Watching the community, watching Ezra. This is, this is not coming out of left field. This is coming straight out of the community. But if everyone that lives with a physical disability can see their disability as their differentiator, 
right, as they see their adversity as their advantage and flip the script on their lives, uh, like the, the, the potential out of our community is unlimited, right? And I think that a lot of the adaptive athletes probably already see and feel and believe this, but as we bring new people into the movement, maybe that aren't you know, aren't as confident, maybe haven't fully accepted themselves or their disability, right? You know, uh, we've got some work to do, right, on a certain segment Mm -hmm. of this population. But I think the athletes can kind of lead the charge too. the ones that are really, right, they love their lives, they love what they're doing, they, you know, they wouldn't trade what, you know, their story, their situation and their life for another life. Uh, and so, yeah, so the word that I use and I will kind of continue to use going forward is I want people to slingshot their lives, right? So the pullback is the adversity and the acceptance is right. Accepting and loving yourself is sort of letting go of the, of the rock and then let, let that thing fly, right? See how far you can take your life. Where's my uh, t-shirt that says slingshot your life? (laughs) <laughs> come on man <laughs> come on you have access to very high quality materials i'd love a t-shirt with it says that um uh, so yeah so that's that's it because i think if when you when i look at you know a lo- we have a lot of common right friends and connections in this in this community but mm-hmm. we've done that right and even in ezra's case you know he he's hitting the emerging and if not the b Paralympic standard in track and field and he just turned 14 right so he's likely to make some of the international competitions this year in track and field for our Paralympic team is he surfing like dad is he out there it's insane he's 14 right and it's not possible on the able-bodied side so he's like proof in the pudding that this works if you if you put your head down and you grind um he does surf a little bit he skateboards a little bit too um He's become very concerned about injury for track seasons. So. I get that. I stopped skateboarding. Um, for that reason, I will not touch any of that right now. I just don't want to mess it up. So now I got th- this question always pops in my head. I know the answer, but our audience might not know the answer. What separates you guys from the rest of the pack for what you do? You know, like we talked a little bit about it. Actually, we talked a lot about it. But in your words, what separates Angel City Sports from the rest? At it, 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 it a, it a real basic level, I bring a, I've just brought a business mentality to it. And in business, if you're not growing whatever you're doing, you're right, if you're not improving your customer service scores or growing your revenue, growing your profit, right, mm-hmm. growing your footprint, whatever it is, um, you're vulnerable, right? Um, you could get fired or reassigned or demoted or a lot of things could happen to you. And so, uh, you know, so I just have that mentality, like, let's just grow, right? Let's take some risks. Let's try things out, knowing that things are not going to work, right? And you'll learn and you'll, you'll pivot. Um, and, and, and so I think that's, that's maybe a differentiator, Right. It's just that that growth mindset that we bring and we're really we're really experimenting. And I don't know if disrupting is the right word, maybe innovating or just trying new things. Right. Let's just try. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's try new things and see what works. I mean, you know, who's doing a celebrity wheelchair basketball game? We've been doing that for five years. Right. Like I get Adam Sandler. The mayor came last year. Rob Snyder. um, you, You know, what I mean, like like nobody's but I also have L.A. and I've you know, we have some access. So that's that's helpful. Not everybody can replicate that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but I think, you know, a level of ri- a risk tolerance and innovation, you know. Um, I think the innovation side where you hit there is you're a real innovator and you're aggressive about it, too, in a good way, in a positive way of um, a lot of a lot of organizations sit on a sideline. Do you want to be part of this? You let it know. We want you to be part of this. We want a community here and we want every athlete out there that's or wants to be an athlete to come join us and be part of us. And that's a real embracing that happens. And not only that, you have this mind, this vision for something huge beyond anything we've seen before. Yeah, because it frustrates me that these programs are small, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, it me too. It frustrates me that... You know, a friend of mine's got a, you know, a wheelchair tennis program that maybe five to 10 people show up every Saturday because he's done all the work to build it. 
right? He's got at the facility, he's got coaches, he's got everything. And how does he not have 20, 30, 50 athletes every Saturday? Because they're there. I know they're there. Within a 10 mile radius, there's probably 100,000 people with a disability from this, right? Yeah. So, so, like, but I, I guess the thing that I would add, you know, to the innovation and just that growth mentality is just being willing to solve the biggest problems we can find, right? Like, in the adaptive world, athlete recruitment is the biggest problem. It is not funding, right? The funding will find you if you can find the athletes. It's the outreach. It's the hard work of building relationships within all these, right, these disability support groups and the hospitals and the schools, you know, and building a brand that can transcend disability and so everyone connects to it and can refer people in and it, right, it becomes its own beast. The momentum can grow. So, that's the struggle that all these programs would say, right? If they're if they're honest, they're going to mostly say that, right? And so you have to be willing to tackle that one. And it's big and it's messy and you'll never get it right. You'll just keep trying and swinging. And, you know, like we, we print 15,000 flyers and we paper the state of California, right, uh, with flyers. We, we attend anything anybody invites us to. You know, but again, you need staff to do that because you got to be able to go in at lunch or, right, during the day to do these things. Um, so I think outreach is like a big one, a big problem we are, where we've been tackling since early days, um, equipment, right? I mean, how many programs are stuck doing what they do? Cause they have like five chairs. Yeah. Yeah. hundred right? percent. Even if they recruited the athletes, they don't have chairs to cover them for the wheelchair sports at least. Right. Um, you, you know, so like, there's like, there's like so many barriers to, to a program's growth that it's it's, it's like this three dimensional puzzle that you have to solve, right? Simultaneously. And you're just, it's super, super tricky. Um, you know, and, and programming and, and, you know, running clinics and finding partners and training coaches like, like that's to me, those are a little bit easier. Um, but, but again, like facilities are not easy, right? No, we don't, we all don't have facilities. So you have to cut deals and figure out how to do that. So it's really right. There's just a lot of big challenges facing facing a program, right? You're talking about the athlete, just the program to get started. Um, and so I do hope over time, Angel City can be a place, can be a platform for those entrepreneurs that want to start something, but don't want to have, don't want to, you know, don't maybe have the skills or ability or the willingness to sort of do all that, that they can tuck in under Angel City. You know, we just started a chapter in Oregon mm -hmm. with some parents, um, you know, that saw an opportunity to create a more competitive teams and, you know, train athletes for swim meets and track meets and things like that. So we've supported them in starting a chapter up there. Um, so I think that there's, there'll be some nice organic growth as we find like-minded entrepreneurs, right. That, that see how hard this is going to be and want to really grow fast and aggressively. Getting in touch with you guys to be part of this. What's the, what's the process for an athlete that's listening right now or a potential athlete? Yeah. I mean, listen, it's a digital world now. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're on social as Angel City Sports, uh, pretty, pretty active uh, on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Primarily, we uh, the, the main website is just angelcitysports.org. The event portal for the games is angelcitygames.org. You can get to either one from from the other. So it's n no big deal which way you come in. But uh but yeah, that's that's the easiest the easiest way. We get you know DMs on social social media, and we get emails that come in to you know info at angelcitysports.org, and you know we we do our best to stay up and respond to everybody. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we're pretty we're pretty accessible, and I'm pretty accessible on social media too. People can find me. What um, about volunteering? I wonder about volunteering. What does it take to be a volunteer at Angel City Sports or the and or the Angel City Games? Yeah, so we have a lot of levels of volunteers that have just evolved over the years. So we have a games planning committee that's probably over forty people. Uh, you know that that donate a you know at least for a few months, some some longer. You know to you know put in multiple hours, five ten hours a week to help us plan and and run the games. So that's a really fun place. There's people on that committee that have done it. You know since it started around my dining room table in. Uh, you know, in the winter of 2015 when we first got started. Uh, so 
that's one we, we you know we love just people that want to show up and and volunteer at a clinic uh you know i have some kind of volunteer kind of leadership roles right i have like pro bono lawyers that help us out uh you know kind of a whole, all different levels um but the games especially for anybody that's in southern cal or willing to tra- travel in is for this year's games there's almost 900 volunteer shifts over five days so a setup day on wednesday june 19th and then so that night's our gala and then the sport and the special events every evening you know just run through the through the weekend okay so for the angel city sports it's not just about the events afterwards you guys have a lot of things going on you have like you have events that are outside of the athletic realm can you tell us what's going on there Absolutely, Scott. There's there's a lot going on, and so just you know, hang with me and breathe uh, as I get through. <laughs> I want to I want to cover everything. I'm there, there might be something that affects you know it, it touches people in different ways. So the Wednesday night before the games kick off is an awards gala. So it's you know kind of a high price ticket. It's a fundraiser for Angel City Sports. Mm-hmm. Mallory Wegman is uh, you know is our our host, and the Foundation for Global Sport Development is our, our presenting sponsor of that, which are really grateful to thursday so now i'm on thursday june 20th that was june 19th uh we start sport that morning and that evening is the first ever athlete resource night so this is like a resource networking fair basically and i've got uh paul de gelder the host of shark week is our keynote uh, who was attacked by a shark and now he's hosting Shark Week, which is insane. He lost two limbs in that shark attack. He's going to tell his story. And I've got 25, maybe even up to 30 roundtable leaders. So senior vice president of, of HR for Hanger Clinic and COOs and you know UCLA admissions officer, just amazing people that give you access to the you know, knowledge you need to get the most out of your education, your career, you know, personal development health and wellness and and even some sports like uh my friends from the hartford are presenting sponsor for the games they're going to talk about how do you get a sponsor right as a paralympian yeah. uh, so that's thursday friday we do an opening ceremonies we do a parade of athletes in an opening ceremonies uh in the afternoon from one to two and then that evening we're doing a, a concert it's a, like a barbecue concert and i have uh we'll have multiple adaptive musicians coming and performing so your, Victoria Canal is kind of our headliner, and she tours. So cool, Michael Franti, and she's just amazing. And she shares her story of right not having an arm and just growing up being different, and and it's it's she's just incredible. Um, Saturday, I mentioned the toddler games is Saturday eleven to twelve, and um, and then Saturday night is our our celebrity wheelchair basketball game. So we've done this for the last five years, and it's really entertainment for our athletes that come in from all over the country and even the world uh, to meet celebrities and and you know just kind of. Then the celebrity, celebrities generally are not very good, so it's kind of funny to watch. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, and then Sunday, there's two more things happening on Sunday, the final day of the games, June 23rd, which is. We're doing a fun run and roll, so uh, a fundraiser at lunch. We shut the track meet down and do some mile around the track, superhero themed. We have a youth council that will be hosting that, just basically kids, grade school through high school age, kids that are running that event. It'll be really cool. We do closing ceremonies uh, as well to kind of round out the e- or, or round out the weekend. But this is for the general public that might be listening. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, our sponsor expo and experience zone is open for anybody with a disability or without a disability. And they can jump into a chair and play wheelchair basketball. They can try adaptive rowing, golf, curling, fencing, table tennis. There'll be an uh, obstacle course with my gym. Uh, the Bruin Fan Alliance will be throwing footballs around with former f- football players from UCLA. Uh, we'll have games and activities for the whole community to come and learn about adaptive sport, meet our community, meet our athletes. Um, and we hope this can over time grow the fans that want to come out and watch our sports. That's amazing. I did have to put an oxygen mask on. You're right. I have, (laughs) you know, (laughs) there's a lot going on, man. It's so much. We have trouble promoting it all, right? It's like, what, what, what are we post about today on social media? Like there's just so many things going on, but once you get there, it all flows beautifully. Athletes don't have to stress about where to be. They come to UCLA. They're there. We got them. 
right? We got you all day with sport and then we got you in the evening with these special events. It's really, it's really, I call it immersive, right? You're just all in with us. That's amazing, man. It sounds like a, an incredible experience. It's just, I don't know, a very special time for sure for everybody, families, athletes, general population, the volunteers, former UCLA football players. Everybody gets a crack at understanding what's going on and they get to experience it. Really cool. You know, we've got a couple of years in on Angel City Sports. We got a couple of years in on Angel City Games, you know? What's your favorite moment or one of your favorite moments from the games? I mean, I told you the Alpha story, so that's that's powerful and it really informed our mentoring program, which I think I'm really excited about that I think I think could ultimately be a game changer for how we do things. Mm-hmm. You know, probably the probably the the moment that I will uh I will remember for the rest of my life is the first year we really didn't, we didn't know what we were doing. Right. And we just were running. I mean, we, we just whipped it together. Um, and we were, we were in the middle of our track meet and, uh, I get a call on the radio that Adam Sandler's arrived. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and so we're, you know, we're, uh, Adam's a, a friend of ours. And I didn't know he was for sure coming, right? I, I let him know what we were doing, right? I said, listen, I've, I've left my job to get this thing started. And, <laughs> you know, he didn't know what it was. He, you know, he knows Ezra and really appreciates Ezra and an athlete that Ez is, but he didn't really know what we were doing. And so I'm at this track meet and I get it on the walkie talkie that, you know, on the radio that he's, he's here. My wife goes and grabs him. He's walking down the stadium stairs at UCLA Drake stadium and adam is like the coolest cat in the world he's so chill he's so mm-hmm. down to earth. he just walks out onto the track in the middle of the meet and he got so mobbed right because even the first year we had people from all over the country right and and anyways it's like just special to get to say hi to adam and take a picture with them or whatever mm-hmm. and he got mobbed we had you know hundreds of people surrounding him and, uh, and I just remember getting on the, on the radio and going, uh, I think we need to shut the track meet down for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so we shut down for like, you know, 20, 30 minutes to let everybody hang with Adam and, you know, get, take pictures and, you know, and then, uh, and then I got, I got him out of there so we could get the track meet started again. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So, that's cool. And, and that, you know, it's just so funny how these things happen. Right. So I went to junior nationals, uh, that, you know, that later the next month with Ezra and word had gotten out, right? Like kids were asking, tell me about Sandler. Is he coming next year? You know, like it just totally sparked something with people that like Sandler came and wanted to meet our kids. He came and wanted to meet our athletes. And Christian Bale was there that year too. He's a little more low key than Sandler. Mm-hmm. Um, he, Christian came a little bit later in the afternoon. And, but like still there's a bunch of kids got to meet Christian and like, you know, like, like it meant so much to our athletes that some of these celebs have come, right. And we've had, you know, Michael Pena and tons of Olympians and NFL players. And, you know, we just, we just get, we get great celebrity support. Uh, Rob Schneider came last year. It just means so much to them. Uh, and so I really have, I've learned, you know, whether the celebrities post and blow it up on social media isn't as important as affecting the lives of the athletes, right? And letting them know that somebody at a really high level, right, and powerful person cares um, and is interested, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, that I mean, that's the really I think the Sandler right moment is just going to go down in my in my mind. But I will tell you, for those that might be able to come to the games this year, the toddler games. So since the first year, we did a run, jump, and throw event for one to five-year-olds, right? And uh, to just get them thinking about competition and realizing that they can be part of something. I love the toddler games, man. Sorry to interrupt, but that is like, that's a pretty badass moment there. It's it's the best, right? And uh, and so this year, we're only doing on Saturday. We used to do it Saturday and Sunday. So we're just doing on Saturday. Uh, and we'll close the track down. All the track officials run the toddler games. They time it. They measure the jump, right? They measure the throws and record the numbers. They make it feel just like a real meet, but it's for little ones, right? And they might be throwing a tennis ball, right? Or a softball instead of a shot put. 
or a turbo jab instead of a, a regular jab. It doesn't matter. It's just the getting them out there and they get to do something. And, and the, and this is everyone's favorite moment of the games, hands down. Because when you see these little guys in these tiny little wheelchairs, you didn't even imagine they could make little wheelchairs that small and these yeah, tiny yeah, yeah. little prosthetic legs and stuff. And they're doing what they can to, you know, complete the race or the throw or whatever. It's the, it's the most adorable thing you've ever seen. And there's just not a dry eye, right? I mean, it's like everyone gets emotional. It's so powerful, right, to give sport to these littles that maybe don't even understand they have a disability in some cases, right? Like they're- That's they're just cool. status quo. That is, right. that's their normal. It's just so cool. It's, it's, it's beyond magical. And I feel like I should be able to find a big sponsor for that at some point. Yeah, come year. on, Nike. Where the <laughs> hell are you on this one? <laughs> right uh, yeah i just it's it's such a magical moment for listeners you can go on youtube i'll link it in the show notes i'll link that particular um a particular clip of a toddler track meet it's a pretty special moment and that really encompasses angel city sports in so many ways is that you're building empowerment you're building a community um and it's it's amazing to see the results and it's just getting bigger it's this sleeping giant that was waiting to happen and you're heading this thing i hope people you know i hope people give you credit for all you've done you know it all changed when ezra was born everything changed for you life was not what you planned it to be ezra came to this you know came to you with some differences some limb differences and from that time forward you figured out ways to relate to him and to empower him and out comes Angel City Sports. That's incredible. And I think it's, you, you summarize it so beautifully. I think, you know, it's, we can all learn from this community. We can all learn from our journey. But like, what do you do when the cards don't fall your way? Right? Yeah. Like, what do you do? And I think we all have choices. And I'm not saying I, I've been able to create an organization like this without help or, and I've probably responded the right the the wrong way lots of times where adversities hit me. But in this case, I have helped. You know, I've taken a, a new challenge that I wasn't expecting and flipped it. Um, but I think that's a really powerful question for all of us in in our lives, right? What do we do when things don't go the way we wanted them to, right? Like, and if we can all turn that into a positive, holy cow! Watch out, world right? Like yeah. that's going to be pretty amazing. It's going to happen to everybody. The wall's there. We're all going to hit the wall. There's going to be challenges, whether it happens at 82 or zero, you know, when you're just born right on that first day, you're going to hit the wall and there's examples. Adaptive athletes to me is the human condition magnified. Any kind of challenge is the human condition magnified, figuring out how to do what to do with that magnification on that athlete, what they do, how they react can be a good lesson to everyone's life. Yep. Yep. For sure. Thanks for coming on, Clayton. Clayton, Freck, I really appreciate you, man. Appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'll be out at the Angel City Games. That's the plan. So I'll be out there in June. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody, just being a part of it, checking it out for a day or two. Are you going to do some sport? I don't, yeah, maybe I'll do some, I, I don't know. It just depends. I'm, I'm training up for an OCR. I'm training for uh Spartan. I'll be doing that up in Utah. So uh, I'm, I've been gearing up. Shape. Come on, let's see it. Yeah, I know. I need to get out there. Yeah, I'll hop in perhaps. I'll definitely, um, you know, I'll definitely be supportive. Whatever I can do to support. So um, in whatever way, you know, and if athletes too that are out there want to talk to me about starting a podcast, vlogging, whatever. I'm there. I'm an ear, man. I'll I'll be I'll do what I can to help. I love that. Well, let, let's talk more about that. I think there's something there. It aligns really well with our ambassador program. Sure. You know, like how do you take your 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 career to the next level and especially those that are right trying to build a real following that could maybe help propel them to an elite level, right? Um, you know, or even just trying to make a living at this, right? Yeah. Like how, how do you how do you do that? There's a map, there's a roadmap. We have our figures out there that have shown how to do it. And, um, you know, there's a way there, there really is. There's a way, but you got to work hard. You'll, t of all people, you, a few others, 
really know what it takes to grind it, to build it. Sean Swentek out there with uh, a walk on water. He's kind of, you know, you guys have a similar mindset. You guys are grinders, you're hard workers, you're innovators, and you have visions. And that's what it takes. You know, it takes a lot of effort. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Thank you. All right, listeners, that's our episode. Remember, go to livingadaptive.com to find previous episodes, show notes, contacts for guests like this guest, links to social media accounts, and a bunch of other good stuff. So go there. Peace.